you're in the VIP section of Black Women in Radio, the podcast, a decade of the new woman. I'm your host, Felicia Love, along with our special guest. She used to actually breastfeed while having sex. While having sex. <laughs> That's multi I mean, multi. I'm trying to hold back the tears and be positive. Yeah. Mm. But at the same time, like, if you can't find a heartbeat, mm. that's, that's, that's not, not right. good. I grew a beard when I was pregnant with both my daughters. Like Father Christmas. I'm too old to have shit sex. My children being taught the best of the West, but where's the rest? I asked Marvin to marry me. Can we just go? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm Karina. I'm Andy McKay. I'm Nanadra Butcher. I am Nina Harrison. I'm Natalie Duval. And we're Don't Black, Black Mars. I've got a lot of mouth. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, as, as we Brits would say, I've got a lot of mouth. I'm quite mouthy. So, um, yeah, I, I, I call stuff out quite a lot. So I think... Um, yeah, people, now's the time everyone's like, she just says it how it is. Get her on. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> oh, great. So people are, are calling you now to find out your opinion on the, the state of our world and in your case, the UK. Yes, yes. So I did, um, I did a, uh, t- a panel talk a few weeks ago with the Female Quotient, which is US based. And we were talking about microaggressions in the workplace. And it was just really interesting to see that actually what happens here is exactly what happens in the US as well. Just it manifests itself a little bit differently or you might have different terminology that you use to describe things, but essentially it's exactly the same. So yeah, it's been, it's been really busy and like my day-to-day job is within the sports industry and in the UK sports is, especially football, which you guys call soccer is such a white male dominated industry in terms of the business side of it behind the scenes so I've been really vocal in kind of addressing that and calling out the the fact that we need equality and um, in all forms gender and race so yeah absolutely Um, I am a avid soccer fan I love soccer now I can't tell you the 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 game but I love watching it (laughs) does that count yeah it does of course it was girl you don't need to know what's going on you just have to enjoy watching it it's fine exactly exactly i love soccer but when you when you were talking about that i was thinking about you know the the diversity in terms of players even is is something to pay attention to because there are a lot of um players of african descent and and brown who are extraordinarily uh, talented and and they're yeah. not being seen. So, do you want to speak to that at all? So we have. Um, so here, I would probably say, um, I reckon probably maybe seventy percent of the players here are um, African or Caribbean backgrounds, or they're black. Um, and what's interesting is we have a real problem here in that the way that the media report on a white player to how they report on a black player player, you can see the differences and kind of the subtle racism even just you know the way that they use to describe the players like black players they'll be like oh you know he has pace and power and it's like okay is there nothing else about him other than that he's fast like he doesn't have any technical skills he doesn't have any other skills other than he is he he has pace and power and you know it's just typical that they see black men in sports as being fast or you know that's how that that, that's all they kind of use to describe them and when it comes to writing about them about things that they may be doing in their private lives like if they buy their mum a house you know if it's a white player it's like this is amazing that he's buying his his mum a house and if it's a black player it's like he's wasting his money the boy from the council estate which is like social housing is you know it, 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 they have a real issue with black players earning a lot of money and spending that money essentially, yes. but it's, it's really weird to me, but yeah, we, we, you know, I, I, I speak about that quite a bit. And the fact that actually if the people writing these news articles were diverse, they wouldn't be writing articles like that. Absolutely. 
That is yeah. so true. And yeah. we're, we're talking about, you know, the need to dismantle systematic uh, or systemic, I should say, racism. But we really need to also pay attention to how things are reported. So mm -hmm. I believe even in the newsroom, just as you mentioned, you know, the way we approach stories and, and um, you know, humanize or dehumanize people really needs to be looked at. And I know for sure that there's a, there's a good old boy mentality when it comes to media, because look at you and I. I mean, I don't know about you in the, in the UK, but it is difficult often for a Black female to get the respect and the, the opportunities in media yeah. that we so deserve. Yeah. And I think what we've been seeing is that, you know, we're tired. We're tired of not getting gigs in mainstream media. So with the rise of social media and online and digital platforms, it's like, just like you, Felicia, it's like, well, you know what, if you don't want me, that's fine. I'm going to create something myself because there's so many different digital platforms that you can put your own content out on. And I think newsrooms and media outlets like the massive mainstream media outlets really need to take note of that because there is a lot of talent that are sh or a lot of people that are so talented that are showing their talents off mm -hmm. by producing writing and making their own content and i think i think it's brilliant i think it's absolutely brilliant it really is and and i get that you know a lot of people look at the numbers but they really need to also look at up and coming because mm -hmm. you may not have the social media media following but absolutely have the substance that it would take to launch a program and and you know sustain one so that needs to be looked at as well but it will take you and i and our group to um you know make that path i i absolutely believe that yeah, no, I definitely agree. And I think, I think what, what a lot of broadcasters miss out on is looking at the numbers. And by looking at the numbers, you're actually probably missing out on a whole demographic and a whole audience. Because what you generally find is the people with the numbers are the ones that are been in the in the industry for years and years and years and years and actually what you want is some fresh talent and if you bring in some fresh talent you know funny or talented new talent actually you're going to get a whole new audience starting to tune into your content and I think a lot of broadcasters need to wake up to that definitely absolutely I am so excited to have an opportunity to meet you thank you thank you it's a shame the rest of the girls couldn't be here but it's so difficult to get all five of us together so I'm I'm here holding it down I love it I'm and I hold it down <laughs> and I appreciate you doing so and I trust me I know what it's like to try to get five different schedules and lifestyles <laughs> together in one place it, it's next to impossible <laughs> um but it's Karina White correct yes Yes. It and is, yeah. you spoke to um, racism in the workplace, and I really wanted to talk about that as well. But I also want to celebrate you as part of the Dope Black Moms, Mums, that is, mm -hmm. uh, podca yes. podcast. So yes. I was just flipping through social media and ran across your podcast, and I was just so thrilled of a few things. One, the candidacy, you guys are just, you know, telling it like it is. And the fact that there was a platform for moms to really talk about how you're feeling, how you're navigating your day-to-day -day life. And it's not all cherry blossoms. Yeah. <laughs> it's work. Yeah, it's work. And I think what, um, what I absolutely love about the podcast is it's not like your traditional mummy podcast yes. we don't talk about our kids like 24 7 or for an hour each episode that's not us we talk about things from the perspective like we talk about womanhood from the perspective and from the lens of being mums and you know having this platform we always said that we wanted to improve outcomes and improve experiences for black mothers and so you know we talk about any and anything as you yes. said, very candidly, you know, we've spoken about sex after childbirth. And mm -hmm. I think on that episode, I was like, look, I'm too old to be having shit sex. You know, we spoke about, spoke Hello. about that. 
effectively, you know. Yes. Yeah, I know you know, Felicia. Yes. We're too old for that. Yeah. So, we, you know, we spoke about that. But then, you know, we have some really funny episodes. But then we also have, you know, quite serious episodes. We've spoken about baby loss. We've had mums on talk about their experiences of losing their babies. Um, we've spoken about the education system here in the UK and how it discriminates um, black boys and how they're expelled from mainstream education and put into PRUs, which are, so PRUs are special schools. If you've been expelled from mainstream school, they're like, um, I don't even know how to describe them, but they're, they're, they are, once you end up in a PRU, there's no kind of uphill from that. It's, it's statistics shows to be downhill and statistically here it's the easy it's the easy answer for the education system to just put black boys into into that system so you know we've spoken about that we've spoken about domestic violence um we've spoken about how we felt around George Floyd and you know Black Lives Matter and how we'd been feeling so yeah we we have like fun podcasts where you know we're laughing for an hour and then we also have quite serious podcasts that address um issues within the black community um which we felt that given the platform that we have it's important to address those and give people the opportunity to come and tell their stories well, I tell you, that is what caught my eye because I, I really walked away with a sense of feeling like I had girlfriends. And that <laughs> is a really good thing. That's a really good thing. That's what you want the listener to feel, you know. And I, I said, I've got to reach out to them. I have got to reach out to them and ask them to become a part of the Black, wo Black Women in Radio movement. And that's really what we are all about. And that is pulling Black women out of the shadows of the conversation uh, when it comes to media and radio. And um, so I really wanted to invite you. We just opened up the Black Women in Radio International movement. So we now have, Amazing. yes, we I'm now have. I'm that now, yay. Yes, and you're part of that. And I'm so <laughs> glad you, you would celebrate that with us because it is a huge deal. And just like we said before, it's going to take all of us to, to create a pathway and show media how it's done. And first and foremost, show them that we have talent and the wherewithal yeah. to have large audiences and sustain them. Um, so the Black Women in Radio platform was created in 2017. And just, just this month, we opened up Black Women in Radio International. So my plan is to bring us all together in one big melting pot and that we use our resources and even conversations like this, Karina, talking about the um, school to prison pipeline is happening here in America as well. And it is a straight path to jail, from school to jail. That's exactly what it is. And I don't think that we recognize, although we have world news, I don't think that we really recognize that the same kinds of things are going on abroad and yeah. it's not until we have conversations intimate conversations between like you and I with people listening on I don't know about you but I'm like I almost jumped out of my skin when I heard you describe you know the school to prison pipeline like here yeah. in the U.S. it is exactly exactly the yeah. same and we've got to make some noise so I'm with you yes I think it's like you said you never really um realize that there's so many parallels and so many issues that are so similar and again just manifests its way itself in different ways but essentially when you get down to the crux of it it's exactly the same issues across the two continents so yeah and here it's I'm scratching my head because I'm, I'm like okay so how does it manifest its way from one country to another and throughout how does that work where are the decisions being made where where, where are the loopholes you know, um, mm -hmm. I know now our eyes are wide open with um, Mr. Floyd, um, but it did raise consciousness across the world that this is something that needs to not only be addressed, but it needs to be plucked out and yeah. healed. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I feel like we're in, I feel like we are in a movement at the moment. I don't know what way it's going to go 
or where we're going to end up or what it looks like. But I do hope that his death and the thousands and hundreds of other people like him, that their deaths aren't in vain and that it doesn't mean anything because it does. And I would hope that some substantial change, positive change can come out of what's happened. Oh, Karina, please. I, I, I pray that as well, because I cannot imagine, and we've lost so many hundreds of thousands of lives mm -hmm. the same way. We're just paying attention to it now. And it's interesting. Do you think that COVID had a, it had a, uh, the pandemic, global pandemic had a hand in this? Because it slowed us down enough so that we're not saying, oh, well, that happened to them, or that was that city, or you know, now we really absorbed the shock. I think it definitely amplified it. But, you know, um, we marched for George Floyd here in the UK. Oh, and, that gives me chills. Yeah, and I'm trying to even get emotional because every time I think about it and I think about kind of the meaning behind it, it, it really does make me emotional. But we marched for George Floyd and we marched in 2016 for, um, there was someone, there, there was a, there was some, it, Trayvon? Some, some, it was Trayvon and someone else. We marched here as well. Mm. And I think what's interesting is a lot of people in the U S don't know that there's a whole wave of people in the UK that are supporting them across yes. the water. But also yeah. because our, our, our police here, they don't carry guns um, as routine. We have specialist firearms officers, but the routine police officers don't carry firearms here. So the problem that we have over here is stop and search in that the police will just stop and search you and they have to have reasonable grounds to stop and search you. And there's procedures that they have to follow in order to do that. And what we're finding now, even more so, is people are filming these stop and searches. There was an incident over the weekend with um, a Team GB athlete. So this is a black woman who runs and represents Great Britain. And her partner, who also represents, um, I think he's put, he represents Portugal because he was, his family is from Portug Portugal, but he's black also. And they were stopped and they were stopped outside their home, pulling up outside their home in an affluent area of London. And the police officer had his like um, truncheon up, ready to break the car window and was screaming at him to get out the car, get out the car. And he was filming it. She was filming it in the back also. And they had their three month old baby in the back of the car. So they dragged him out. They were trying to drag her out and handcuffing her. And they were, they were filming all of this. Mm -hmm. If that evidence was not there, that video evidence was not there, they would have told a complete different story because the statement that the police put out straight away then later contradict itself. And then they then were forced to have to apologize to her for the distress that they caused her. Mm. And because obviously she was so high profile, you know, it, it had to be addressed. But what we're seeing is a rise in these stop and search, st uh, stop and search cases and where young black men are being targeted and it's, we are stopping you on suspicious of, suspicion of drugs. They don't have to have evidence that they think you may have drugs or they just have to say, we have a suspicion and that is reasonable grounds to search you. Okay. The searches are in, they're, they're, they're embarrassing. They are aggressive. They're intimidating. The language that is being used is unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, although we see these incidents in the US happening and where it's ending in loss of life, the one thing we don't have here is that our police here don't have guns. So they're not ending in, in death. But what they're ending in is men walking away and feeling angry. Yes. Angry against the system angry against what these police officers represent, angry against people that wear the, the, the police uniform. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really destroying community relations. Absolutely. So 
when I say, you know, we have similar things that happen, but they just manifest themselves in different ways. That's what I mean. We, we, we are being oppressed here. We are being discriminated against here. We have men um, serving sentences in jail for crimes that they may not necessarily have committed or crimes that they did commit, but they're serving a longer sentence than that of their white counterparts. Right. And what I think is with the whole um, pandemic is that people have got time now to show up. Yes. People yeah. have got time to galvanize, to organize themselves, to think of how can we change this? And also people are fed up. They've had enough. When you keep lighting a pot and it's boiling and it's boiling and it's boiling, at some point, Felicia, it's going to boil over. Yes. And everyone's reached their boiling point. We're bo boiling over and we are tired. Absolutely. We don't care what happens anymore. It's like, nope, we're going we're gonna to speak out against this. We're going to march for this. We're going to march for that. We're going to you know, use our voices. We're going to really start holding organizations to account. And yeah, so I definitely think the pandemic has um, amplified it. People, are, you know, they, they've got time on their hands. They're at home. They're not doing anything. They're in lockdown. So yeah, they've got yeah. time. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I think that this is this was needed. God knew, you know, <laughs> that this is what was needed to slow us down so that we because a lot of us have just been numb to what has happened. And it's like, you know, as long as my immediate circle is OK, family and, and you know, the work and and I'm able to sustain sustain my home, um, you know, we'll just keep pushing along but it we are we are boiling over and some of us didn't even realize how how traumatic you know this was in our immediate lives because i don't know about you but it it forced me to start digging in more history and mm -hmm. finding out that half of this i didn't know i didn't learn in school you know, but i'm relearning my history and and just more curious about different you know, characters in, in history. And, and it has really, I don't know about you, but Netflix has a Black Lives Matter segment now. And I, I asked about this a couple of weeks ago. I was like, was this there? Did I miss something? It wasn't there. It wasn't there. <laughs> it wasn't they, had, there. they had the strong Black lead um, category, but yeah, they've definitely added Black Lives Matter. I think a lot of the um, digital platforms have. So Netflix, I iTunes, uh, sorry, yeah, iTunes, Spotify, they've all added kind of this Black Lives Matter category. And I'm like, this is brilliant, but why was it not there before? Why wasn't it there before? Yeah. Exactly. What kind of change do you think you and I could make? In um, just in general? Just in, or? In, in, in the change of our world, because we're in the same position the same things are happening to both countries and and yeah. countries around the world but what is it that little old you and little old me can do um to make a change you know felicia i've always been really um outspoken on diversity equality and social justice and social mm -hmm. change and i think me personally so I sit on the board of an organization called the Black Collective of Media and Sport, and we work with broadcasters um, and print uh, newspapers and radio to ensure that they are being diverse. And, you know, we've worked with them for about 10 years now. We've, be, we've existed for t uh, just over 10 years and nothing really has changed. So when this all happened, we sent an, a letter to all of them, basically saying, we're frustrated. It's time for you to pull up. It's been 10 years, nothing's changing. So what's good? Right. So, you know, we, we gave them seven very clear points of things that we wanted to change. And that was very specific to sports media. I know that people, my friends that work in the music industry, they've done something similar um, here and in the States where they have, also written letters to chairmen of record labels, to music organizations with very specific points about what needs to change. And I think 
what I specifically can do is try and affect change in the respective environments and industries that I have access to. So I have access to sports. I'm already trying to address inequality in the sports media within um, Dope Black Mums as a platform. We are calling out and we are holding organizations to account. So we are about to launch a partnership with the leading baby loss charity here in the UK because we noted that if we're saying that we are trying to improve outcomes for black women in the UK, similar to in the US, black mothers are five times more likely to die during childbirth than any other ethnicity. We are also more likely to lose our babies or to have premature births. So why is it that an organization that is meant to be supporting mothers that have lost their babies or families that have lost their babies has completely erased the voice of the black mother? So where are the black mothers who are experiencing baby loss being supported? How are they being supported? And where are they going for support if the charity who is meant to be supporting them doesn't even have anyone that looks or sounds or understands the cultural differences in how black people process grief? Absolutely. So, you know, we have a platform. Yeah, we have a platform. We are holding them to account. So we are now working with them and saying, look, you know, you've got a problem. We know you've got a problem. How can we work collaboratively and in partnership to ensure that this changes and improves going forward? So they're one. I, I, I'm definitely, there, there's brands on my radar, Felicia, that I just haven't got to yet. I love and they it. Think that they think that they've got the, they think that they've got away with it. They haven't. I just haven't. I just haven't. They they they're just number twelve on the list, and I haven't got to number twelve yet. So, don't worry. I'm going to get to them soon. But I think, yeah, I think it's just about trying to affect change in in areas and environments that you you are in, and it doesn't have to be on a major scale. You know, if anyone is listening and exactly. they're in the supermarket and they see something happening use your voice and speak out and say something and try and you know hold people to account and if there's any non-black women listening be an ally it's not difficult be an ally understand and recognize your privilege and use it to help other people and to improve outcomes for other people because even you know one of my friends she said she's um mixed heritage but she's very, very fair. So if you look at her, she looks white. Mm -hmm. And she says, you know, I recognize this privilege and I recognize that people see me and they see me as white. So she said, you know what? I'm going to call out stuff every time I see it and I need to because I have a privileged position that people don't necessarily look at me and see me as black. Although I feel I'm black, if you look at me, you wouldn't think I am. So Mm -hmm. I'm in a privileged position to, you know, be an ally or to call things out and stuff. So... It doesn't have to be on a grand major scale. It just has to be doing your part and joining the fight with the hundreds and thousands of other women globally that are doing little things in their industries, in their towns, in their areas, in their workplaces to try and affect and have a fairer society. Absolutely. And there's so much to do. So it's not that you have to start in any one particular area, just start, you know, Mm -hmm. just start. We just Mm -hmm. mentioned the school systems. That's, that's something else that needs, you know, grand attention because this is the, the promise of our future and how we are conditioning them now to believe that they're less than and, and not worthy is, is, is a very dangerous thing. Very dangerous Mm -hmm. thing. I love the way you have um, absorbed this cause and positioned yourself in a way to promote change. Absolutely huge. No one has the luxury of turning a blind eye. No one does. Yeah, Yeah, no one does. And I think we, we have a platform, so we wouldn't be doing ourselves justice or the people that support or listen to us if we're not trying to use our platform to affect change in some way shape or form 
Absolutely. Well, I know Black Women in Radio has done some similar things to you. And this program, I was hoping to become a part of the Black Women in Radio International piece, but it's also now, um, at, now that we're having this conversation, absolutely a portion of the Community Matters um, segment that we do. So that's how we uh, try to promote change. We've talked mm -hmm. to um, Michael Julian Bond, um, here in Atlanta about social justice and, you know, his father uh, was in the civil rights movement and now he's serving in Atlanta in, um, as a councilman. So we're, we're trying to figure out how we can get people mobilized where they are. And mm -hmm. so you and I resonate absolutely. And I love that. And if that, let me just say, if there's any collaboration that you think, think that would be a good fit for us let me know let me know because we are on the same page yeah i will definitely don't worry you'll be like ah oh, karina not again another <laughs> another collaboration i'm like felicia girl you said <laughs> i did and you can hold me to it because that's the whole point of black women in radio and, and it's funny because when we first started it was like oh it's a little kumbaya movement of black women oh no Oh no, we don't need any more sororities. We need to do some business, you know? <laughs> we need to make some noise. And making noise is exactly what we do once we raise our voices, once we make our needs known and our experiences known, which is one reason why I do the podcast, so that, you know, a person that's in Tennessee now feel they, they, absolutely resonate with what's going on with you in the UK. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, this is, yeah, this is yeah. great. So, okay. So, so back to your podcast, <laughs> you have how many women? Is it five? There's five of us that um, front the podcast and kind of run the movement, but we have um, two WhatsApp groups um, in each of the WhatsApp groups or across the two WhatsApp groups, I think there's about 360 mums across the two WhatsApp groups. Then we have a Facebook page and then we have the Instagram, the Twitter, um, the F Facebook group and the WhatsApp groups are digital safe spaces. So you have to be a black mother or um, be caring for a child um, as a black woman to um, be in either of those spaces. And that is because, you know, we see parenting forums here in the UK and they don't say that they're for white, white they don't say they're exclusively for white mums, but they're for white mums. They, yeah. you know, when you look at the content that's on, and you know, the advertisers that advertise on there, it, it's for white mums. Mm -hmm. um, so we really wanted to create these safe spaces where black mums could come and bring their whole selves and don't care about being judged, don't care about, you know, what people may think, but bringing their whole, whole selves, any problems that they might have to, you know, seek advice from other mums, to be supported, to laugh, to cry. And, you know, the, the sisterhood that's being created in these groups is absolutely amazing. Um, mums have found friends within the groups they've been out for brunch like we do brunches but then they've like gone and you know met met their friends from the group at brunches and gone to brunch or gone to like day parties or to the cinema and so it's just really amazing to see the sisterhood that's being created from these groups and what we're now seeing is, you know, um, especially on Facebook, we're seeing a lot more mums join from the States, from Africa, from the Caribbean, um, that just want to be a part of these safe spaces and want to be a part of this movement and community of, you know, black mothers globally. So yeah, it's, um, it's been it's been really overwhelming and the support that we've had from from people has been amazing but yeah so there's there's five of us that's kind of like the core five that do the podcast but then we have a whole tribe of mamas behind us i love that a whole tribe of mamas boy i tell you what we can rule the world <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mama definitely. bears and are, <laughs> they're a thing <laughs> yes <laughs> 
love it. I love it. And it's so exciting to be worldwide, isn't it? It is like, even doing this with you, it's like, this is crazy because it's like, sometimes I'm like, I can't believe that we have people listening or that know about us that's like overseas. Like I have family in America and stuff. So it's so, like, I know they listen to it, but it's like your family, you kind of have to listen yes. to it. So to, <laughs> to know that there's, you know, people who aren't family in the traditional sense, um, listening into the podcast, it's, yeah, it's brilliant. And to know that we're, you know, reaching people in all corners of the world is, is amazing. Well, I cannot wait to share you and the rest of the mums with Black Women in Radio Platform. Um, this is our first interview, but it will be one of many, I'm sure. Um, but just the, the wonderful opportunity to be able to share what you're doing with what we're doing, it, it just so merges. It, it, it mm -hmm. feels so good. And I'm willing to bet you're gonna have more people listening um, as well, because I know that now I'm an empty nester, but you know, I, there have been many of times where I wanted to just hear other moms and, uh, and be able to understand that I'm not the only one that's feeling whatever it is that I'm feeling. And that that's makes a world of difference when you can hear yeah. someone else say, Oh yeah, I've done that. Because when you're yeah. feeling like a loner, I mean, you can go into depression in a heartbeat. It's like, yeah. what, why did I and get that number? That, that's what it's about. You know, we yeah. want to, we, we want to show motherhoods from all spectrums. So even, you know, women who may not necessarily want to be mums or women who have become like one of, one of my friends, um, she is in the, the mums group and that's because her own mother passed away earlier this year and her mum was carer for her cousin because his mum died last year. And so, so his mum died last year, her aunt, died last year her mum became the carer of her cousin then her mum passed and so now she is legal guardian for her cousin and so she's not a mum in the traditional sense but actually she's caring for a teenager and we should be supporting her she may not have given birth herself right. but she's still a she's still a mum she's still carrying out that those motherly duties so come on in you've got a whole tribe of mums who are mums supporting you in this journey that you've just picked up in uh, you've picked up a teenager you haven't gone through the baby <laughs> the toddler yeah. the preteen you've literally just got a teenager so Woo! you know <laughs> I don't, I, don't know like? how, I, I don't know how she does it felicia because my daughter know. is on preteen mode at the moment and i'm like who wants to take her? Like, who wants to take her? Because I'm I done. Know. But, I you know, know. It's, it's, it's really important to showcase motherhood in all aspects in that, you know, you don't have to have given birth to be a mum. Mm -hmm. You you know, we want to support mums that may be, um, that may be in same-sex relationships. Mm -hmm. We want to support mums that, you know, may be in interracial relationships, black mums that might be in interracial relationships. Yeah. We want to support mums that may have been on the cusp of motherhood and then lost it and then haven't quite reached there yet. We want to support mums who are actively trying to become mums. Um, you know, we, we, we want people to know that motherhood isn't just... You have your kids, you have your partner, and you live happily ever after. Oh, honey, is that not the story? <laughs> you know, everyone thinks it is. And I'm like, no, you can be a single mom and not, you know, you, you can be a single mom and be a high flyer. You don't have to, you, you, not everyone fits into that stereotype of single moms. Exactly. And even if you do, that's okay, because we're still here to support you, you know, like we want to show the different amazing variations of being a mum. And I love the fact that you guys also showcase your individuality. You talk about what it's like to be a mom, but you also talk about yourselves, you know, your careers, your, your love life, your whatever your 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 desire to travel and not be being able to so all of that's so important because when we as nurturers start to just zone in on the child we forget about ourselves and or feel guilty 
for wanting to go back to work or wanting to have a different experience. So I love this. I love it. It's so needed. And I hope that it's in every city and state across the world um, because it's absolutely a, um, a safety net, a, a network that, that is needed. I, you know, I love it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's important. I mean, for me personally, and Natalie, like, we are probably, well, probably me, actually, I I probably say I'm like the party mum that hardly knows what's going on, that's most likely to be drying school uniform in the car on the way to school on a Monday. <laughs> I love it! I only washed it on like that morning because, you know, I've been not doing anything for the whole weekend or doing my motherly responsibilities and that's fine and that's that fine is because, fine yeah it's okay to be sick and tired of your kids like um mm-hmm. natalie and i have spoken about the fact that we are fed up of our kids we didn't ask to be around them 24 hours a day we you know when we had kids we didn't expect that we would be in a pandemic and we would have to sit with our kids 24 hours a day and be a cook and be a cleaner and be a homeschool teacher i didn't sign up for that felicia so i'm like it's okay to say you're fed up of your kids it's normal and i think the more we normalize things instead of trying to act like everything's okay we'll probably have happier mums. Like, <laughs> it's fine to love. It doesn't mean I don't love my kids anymore. It just means they're actually quite annoying being yeah. around 24 hours a day in lockdown. And that's probably why you drink every evening, you know? <laughs> but it's about normalising things, and making mums know that actually everything that you are feeling is normal. Yes. <laughs> You're human. Yes, absolutely. But let me tell you something. When when I was having children, about 20 years with my girls are 25 and 21 now. I, and I just felt like, how dare I say I'm tired of my kids? Or how dare I say, damn, this girl talks a lot. <laughs> Traded the life out of me. <laughs> you know, and you just felt like you're supposed to be there prim and proper and oh my god it is so freeing to say look (laughs) you need to go in your room I don't know I don't have all the answers that was the most freeing thing I've ever said to my girls it freed us both I think all three of us I said mommy does not have all the answers I don't know everything I'm trying to figure it out now so if I mess up I'm dealing with what I'm dealing with so (laughs) That was and that's okay. Moment. Yes, I, was like, I can't figure it out. I don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> I think I created a monster because my my youngest now um, would start to notice the adults around her and see them for who they were. <laughs> they were trying to play like they knew it all, and she knew. It. She She's like, you don't know anything. Mm-mm. You don't know anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you just have to be open and honest with your kids. Like yes. my daughter, no, I say to she, she knows she'll be like, "Mom, I'm getting on your nerves, aren't I?" And I'm like, "Yes, you mm-hmm. are." And she's like, "All right, I'm going to keep quiet for a little bit." And I'm like, "Yes." And you know, I'm I encourage for her to say, "Mom, you're getting on my nerves," because I know it works both ways. I'm not perfect, you know. So there's going to be days where, yes, I probably do get on her nerves, and I keep on whining at her and stuff. And you know, I want her to be able to say, "Mom, you're annoying," or whatever, because. I can't pretend to be perfect. I'm not. And I'm not going to pretend that, you know, my child is absolutely perfect and that she doesn't get on my nerves or that she takes 10 minutes to tell a story that could have been told in a minute, you know, (laughs) but, and it's okay. It's okay to, you know, it's okay to think that your kids are perfect. It's okay to think that, you know, actually they get on your nerves sometimes. It's fine to think all of these things that you're thinking. I think the more we release mums and allow them to bring their whole selves and be honest, the more we'll figure out parenthood a little bit quicker. Absolutely. Absolutely. And not hold our kids to a standard we can't even hold. (laughs) No. I taught for a little bit um, in uh, K through K through 12. So I called myself 
becoming a substitute teacher just so that I could, you know, watch my children grow and, and let them know that I'm not, you know, not far away and I'm really into what they're doing. And girl, please. I, uh, <laughs> by the time they got to element up to um, high school, I guess, sophomore year or so, I was like, Felicia, why are you doing this? You don't even like it. <laughs> visit some of the elementary schools and I'd come out with my hair on fire. I was like, this is not where I need to be. Stop this is it. not for me at all. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> Boy, the things we think we, we is a good idea. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm not going to hold you much longer. I do want to talk a little bit about, um, I want a sneak preview of what you talked about in your last conversation, because I am doing another podcast called Business Gets Personal, and we are talking about racism in the workplace, and I just wanted a little snippet. <laughs> so, <laughs> Tell me a bit, um, what you say? <laughs> say. <laughs> So I was talking about microaggressions and how it manifests itself. And I was saying, you know, they will, when you have um, African-Americans that have, or uh, uh, black people in the UK in the workplace that have um, very traditional names, for example. So oh, yes. you might be called um, Ola Yinka um, Abayameng or something like that. And they'll, you know, you can, they'll say, you know what, I'm just going to call you O, but that's not my name. Yeah. That's, that's not my name. And if I ask you to pronounce Czechoslovakia, you will say that and it will roll off the tip of your tongue. So yes. you're going to learn my name because that is my name and that is my identity. So you're going to learn my name and you're going to say it in full because it's not being shortened to O, you're going to say my name in full. Yes. And I was saying, you know, a lot of, that a lot of the racism in the workplace takes the form of microaggressions so not being able to pronounce your name properly or not making an effort to pronounce the name properly you know saying things like oh you've done so well um for a black woman to get to where you are or are you the diversity hire mm -hmm. or um where are you from no where are you really from no, I'm, I'm American or I'm British. No, where are you really, really from? <laughs> oh, you mean Atlanta or you mean London? No, where are you really from? <laughs> or, it's oh, not funny, I... but it's just unbelievable yeah. because we've yeah. heard these things. We've heard yeah. it. Yeah, or they go on holiday and they get a tan and they're like, Felicia, I'm as dark as you. Oh, all the time. my tan. I'm as dark as you, Felicia. And it's like you really thought about that it came out of your mouth and you didn't see not one bit of problem with what you just said like I seriously definitely heard that um yes. so you know it was talking about that and then basically i was saying that um i really do feel that unconscious and conscious bias training is needed because a lot of the time when people are acting out microaggressions they know what they're doing it's yes. not unconscious mm -hmm. they they full well know what they're doing mm -hmm. um so I felt that organizations needed to implement conscious and unconscious bias training, but also to enable employees, black employees, to have access to um, counseling and counseling from um, therapists or counselors that look like them or can understand the issues that they may have. So if you're talking about microaggressions in your workplace and you're accessing counseling because of your experiences as a black person within the workplace is a white therapist going to understand or be able to relate to those, those those feelings or you know how it's made you feel so I think it's important for organizations to recognize that and if they do have you know access to counseling or therapy services they need to ensure that there are black therapists I think within the US it's more common in the UK definitely not that common to have um, access to a black therapist so that's something that you know i was saying organizations need to look at but also allies in the workplace need to look at how they can position themselves to be allies and to speak up against 
racism, against microaggressions, against discrimination, because we can't do this by ourselves because we get labeled as the aggressive black woman or the angry black woman, or you're always going on about race or you're all, you've got a chip on your shoulder. And it's really important for allies to also pull up and recognize how they can join us in the fight for breaking down systematic racism, organizational racism, and just racism in general, um, racism in general um, existing in the workplace. Because, and the reason why I say organizational racism is because a lot of the time, organizational policies, managers, and senior leaders position themselves to allow microaggressions and subtle and covert racism to exist within organizations and workplaces and until we start to break those down nothing's going to change karina which is just pure and simple bullying basically it's it's bullying and yeah. it it it's staggering how much i know america has has uh, spent money on, you know, this anti-bullying promotion, and yet we still have it in so many different pockets of our society. But in business, absolutely. Uh, I was just telling a colleague of mine, you know, it's like you're supposed to be making this presentation and they may tell you a different date and time and then make you out to be the incompetent one. You know, it, yep. it's things like that. It's subtle. You can't say, oh, that's racism, but you, you know it exists. So I love, yep. I love the idea that you have to have allies um, within organizations. It used to be called HR. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> yeah, that. that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but it used to be called HR, but, you, but it has to be a system within the organization that is absolutely for the employee and helping the employee matriculate through their yeah. their day to day business. Yeah, it is such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for having me on, Felicia. It's, honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure. It really has. Well, thank you. And tell all of the ladies, I, I adore what they're doing and to just keep doing it. And we will absolutely be listening along. And I'm looking forward to doing some kind of collaboration. Um, I don't know what that is yet. We can just marinate on it, but it really feels right. Um, yep. you know, I'm to, a big believer on when the time's right, it yeah. will just manifest itself and we'll know straight away that that's what we need to be doing. So, yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. Just just to know that you've got a tribe behind you feels good. <laughs> yes, definitely. And I've never been to Atlanta, Felicia. So you, when I come, I will be dialing you in. Oh, sis, I, let's 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 link up. So as soon as things go back to normal, and we can fly again. ATO is on the, one of the list of my places to, to visit. So Wonderful. And I'm a party girl at heart too. So I love socializing and eating well and, and oh. having a nice drink and lots and lots of laughter. So as long as there's hands. food, as long as there's food, laughter and drink, I am sold. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thanks so much, Karina. I won't hold you Thank much you. longer. I, I'm just... I feel your spirit, so I love it. And it's, it's been so such much. a pleasure. It, honestly, thank you so much for having me. And um, yeah, I look forward to this being a long lasting relationship and friendship. So thank you. You are welcome. And I'll be in touch soon. <laughs> no worries. Thanks, Felicia. Ah, ah, here we go. Um, like talking to radio people because they just get it. We just yeah. get it. We have our own, we have our own vernacular. We have our own language. We just get it. Because my business partner at the time, I was doing like webinars on how to get into radio and all these different things and trying to figure out who I am in this space, not having a radio station to go to, still trying to get into television, doing a little bit of television, trying to figure out where I was. I was cool with everybody and, you know, they try to pit us against each other, which I hate. I just believe that for those of us who are still breathing and living, we have to now truly live on purpose.
Be careful as you exit your VIP seats. They will be waiting for you next Wednesday when we talk to the Black Women in Radio Women in Charge panel discussion featuring Pat Prescott, Big Sue, First Lady Joyce Littell, Danielle Johnson, Angela Green, and me, Felicia Love. Make sure you subscribe to Black Women in Radio podcast on all social media and check out our website at www.blackwomeninradio.com.